Tech Talk with Matthew Dickerson. Matt, 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 Matthew Dickerson. Sit back and relax. It's time to talk technology. Greetings, everyone, and a hap, hap, happy new year to you. Welcome to the podcast with all the news from what will surely be another huge year in the realm of all things scientific and technological. Welcome to Tech Talk with Matthew Dickerson 2024 style. We are bursting into the new year with some renovations. We're pitching out the old and refurbishing with the new. Today we're farewelling the 3G network, which has been a part of the communications decor for so long. But like a bottle green Velour lounge setting, it's been showing its age. Also, we'll be cleaning out some dusty corners and sweeping up some dirty rotten scammers that have been lurking amongst the dust bunnies. And we're installing some bionics to make life a little bit easier. But here, now, holding the future in the palm of his hands, let me herald the new year by introducing the illustrious and indefatigable... Matthew Dickerson, welcome to 2024, Matt. Thank you, James. I've been called a lot of things before, but never indefatigable. <laughs> Is that it? Did I get it right? <laughs> We've just been for a run, and you seem like you're fine. Okay, good. That's it. Absolutely that's unable to be fatigued. <laughs> good. Well, that's me. <laughs> <laughs> so it is an exciting year. Oh, well, it's already an exciting year, but I think it will be an exciting year. Technology just shows no signs of slowing down. I'm sure people have said that for centuries, yeah. but I just see things that happen and things that happen over the break and everywhere you go, everywhere you turn. In fact, we stayed at a motel over Christmas, over the Christmas break, and we'd stayed there once before and they were doing some work on the lifts. It was a bit frustrating because they had one of their lifts out of action when we were staying there, so the lifts were a bit slow. And I talked to one of the staff there, so what do you do? So I'm oh, putting a whole new lift system. Oh, that'll be interesting. So we stayed there again and the whole new lift system is quite interesting normally you would press a button and then sit there and wait. We used to play a competition with the kids. Which lift is it going to be, kids? Mm. Yeah, let's bet it's going to yeah. be one, two or three. <laughs> Teach them how to gamble at a young age, of That's course. Right. Yeah, cool. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then they'd come at some random period of time and you'd get in and then you'd obviously press the button or you might have to, in the flash lifts, wave your key card in front of the sensor and hope it worked and then press the button for the right floor. Well, this concept did away with all of that and there was a sensor outside the lift and you waved it in front of the sensor and then it did two things. On a screen, it came up and said which lift it was going to be, so that took away all the fun of no. guessing with the kids. Well, you can do that still as you're walking up to Correct. the sensor. Correct. Yeah, yep, okay. we did do yeah, that, right. so we worked so that one don't out. Don't give up, folks. Don't give up. <laughs> and then the second thing it did, it told you how long it was going to be for whichever of those lifts was going to be the selected one, which I thought was great because sometimes you come out and you do that, oh, I just want to grab something or how long yeah. is it going to be? So you actually get a time frame and if you're told how long something's going to be you get less frustrated this is psychologically proven that you get less frustrated if you know if you don't know how long it's going to be oh this lifting forever might have been 20 seconds if it comes up and says 40 seconds you go okay i'm expecting to be 40 seconds that's that's kind of okay so that was fascinating and then you got in the lift and there were no buttons you just got in and put your faith so what do the kids do then? Because that's their job. It was the problem was that so many people do the Christmas tree that it's just too frustrating. They're, they're pressing every button. In the lift. <laughs> but yeah, what about when you got kids and they want to press the button? It's like, sorry, kids. Here's the card to We've wave in front of the all sensor. Your phone. Yeah, well, yeah. there is still the closed door button, which I guarantee yeah. does nothing. So you can still press the closed door <laughs> button as many what times as you like. Is it satisfies the consumer? Well, I think that's right. I think it satisfies your frustration. I want the damn door to close. I press this button ten times. And look at that, it closed. So it's proven. <laughs> I think the only button that actually works in the lift is the open door button or kick yeah, door yeah, open right. button. But, but I normally just shove my arm in the middle of the lift and w- hope or wait for the sensors to take effect. So wherever we go, there's technology. And today's stories, again, gives us a bit of a snapshot. And in fact, maybe a little bit of a glance back to last year, although we've done the last two episodes have been a full review of last year. Mm. So they've been, I think, pretty good. And it's quite fascinating some of the things that have happened over the year. And I've got some great feedback from listeners about those. But again, this year, I'm, I'm full of excitement about what's going to happen this year. So keep the feedback coming. Thank you for tuning in, listeners. Happy New Year. And I'm looking forward to a great year. Well, let's get into uh, this year's show then. Um, here's a story that's bound to get you thinking. If you could have had your fortune predicted for you, oh, sorry, your fortune, everyone wants their fortune predicted. If you could have your future predicted for you, would you want to know? Now, we all know that AI is clever, but one particular version of AI is having some astonishing accuracy in predicting major life events, notably in predicting people's deaths. Matt, I see an open can of worms on your lap. It seems like a little bit of a morbid situation, doesn't it? Isn't it? If and you could know 
When you're going to die, would you want to? Do you want to know that? No. That's right. Oh, dear. <laughs> so it's interesting. And when you talk about AI being clever, it's an interesting concept that I used to have way back when I was at school. What is clever? When someone says someone's intelligent or clever, a lot of the times back at school is that they can remember things. Mm. But we don't need to remember things anymore. We've got a computer in our yeah, pocket yeah. that knows all the information in the world yeah. ever. So it remembers things. So... Now what is cleverness, what's intelligence, being able to work out things, being able to be creative, maybe the whole art sector, which maybe was ignored for a century or so, maybe the art sector is going to come back and be creative. Who knows? But in this scenario, what AI has done is just looked at so much data, way more data than humans could possibly crunch, take all that data and then make some predictions about what's going to happen in your life. And so you think, sure, an insurance company says, do you smoke? Yes, no. Well, they probably add 10 years or subtract 10 years from your yeah. life for smoking. So you've got some simple points like smoking and drinking and exercise and your weight, those type of things. But what this did was they took 6 million people in Denmark. They looked at a whole range of information on them. They looked at their health stats, the simple things you'd normally expect. Mm your employment scenarios, your financial records. They looked at your educational background, how many visits to the doctor. I mean, I don't know how they got wow. access to all this data. Yeah. It sounds fascinating. Yeah, yeah, that's like for so, every person. I wonder, you know, do they get six million volunteers or do they just go, <laughs> right, let's just go. I don't think they could have <laughs> possibly got that many volunteers. So there had to be some forced information here. Yeah. And they looked at all that data over a 12-year time frame and then use that data to start predicting when people would die. And then obviously they're looking at some older age groups because not much point looking at when people are going to die when they're 18 because it's probably going to be a long time before you get mm -hmm. that. But so they're looking at the 65 plus age group and started making predictions. Sorry, and, and so what time frame are we looking here? Did you say 12 years? They took 12 years of that data. I so didn't realise that it, AI had been around that long. No, no, it hasn't. But the data's ah. been there. So they basically fed all that information into yeah, an AI you. tool okay. today and said, here's 12 years of data, ingest all that, do what you will with all that, and now give me some prediction. Now, when they started looking at that, and obviously in the period we're talking about, they can look at that data and some people have died out of that cohort. Mm. So then they said, let's see how accurate it is. Well, you've got actuaries who are paid a lot of money mm. by insurance companies to get it pretty close to right because that the whole premium model relies on that being pretty close to right. This model proved 11% more accurate than the best models that they've got available to insurance companies at the moment. And of course, the first thing is, well, insurance companies will take this and make some people almost impossible to insure. Yeah, right. And that doesn't sound like great for yeah. society out there. The potential applications they're talking about are things like early health issue detections. Mm, I'm not convinced. Governmental use to reduce inequality. Mm, I'm not convinced. I think just insurance companies will be using this data. Yeah. <laughs> and they've got for the sure. ones, that, well, they've got the money behind them to justify going out and spending the money on the AI tools to get their premiums right. Now, you might see this is used in a positive way because insurance companies could say with all this data, we've got the best insurance premiums because we don't have to have such a gap, such a, an amount that they build into their model to allow for inaccuracies. If they get the model more accurate, mm. my logic is, they could get the premiums more accurate. Maybe they just want to make more profits and then they go the other way, but they could mm. supposedly get those premiums more accurate and more reflective of what your risk factors are as an individual. So if you know you've got a high premium, that's your hint. That's, that's, <laughs> that's right. So if the premium says your premium is three times what your friend is, your partner is, whatever it might be, then yeah. Yeah, start saying your boys. <laughs> so it's a, it's a fascinating concept, but this is the sort of stuff that we'll start to see with AI, mm. things that we hadn't thought about doing and mm. applying it because it can just ingest so much data. Goodness me. In today's Digital Dive, we're untangling a twisted tale of trickery. Scammers are using a veil of virtual anonymity to sell fake medical documents to anti-vaxxers. It's a pandemic of fraudulence that's spreading faster than a virus in a crowded room. Matt, these poor anti-vaxxers are copying it from all, all angles now. I actually think this is a bit of karma, this one. <laughs> this is, yeah, that's the word. <laughs> because people are trying still to go and buy fake doctor certificates, COVID-19 certificates. And I'm wondering, who's still checking those? That's the thing. I don't think that many countries are still checking them. There used to be 
needed for travel. It used to be mm. needed for employment. Not many organisations are still checking, but there's obviously some out there. Could enough. it be that the people who are going for this and the being anti-vaxxers, they're just not paying enough attention anyway, <laughs> and that's maybe a personality trait? Maybe. Maybe they're just <laughs> accepting anything they see. My employer yeah. maybe have a yeah. COVID-19 certificate. I better go and get one then. So what I like about this story, it's got lots of things not to like about it, but what I like about it is people who want to trick the system and have their certificate to prove that they're able to go to work or travel or whatever – they don't want to go and get the jab. Mm. For whatever reason, they don't want to get the jab. They're going and buying doctor certificates. Mm. There's no surprises here to me that these doctor certificates aren't legitimate <laughs> because you would hope that most doctors out there would be legitimate enough that they wouldn't just hand out fake certificates. Exactly. They would say, no, I'm only going to give you a certificate if you've got the correct mm-hmm. immunizations. Sorry, I'm not going to do it for you. What is a bit scary, though, is they're using legitimate doctor's photos legitimate yeah, doctor's right. information to, to make it look legitimate. And then there's some pretty easy desktop publishing out there that you can make a certificate look legitimate and then post it out there and sell it. The prices you'll pay for them, $250 up to $500. I mean, it's cheaper mm. to get a jab, isn't it? It's free to get a jab, but I know <laughs> no. that defeats the whole purpose. They don't want to get the easy. jab. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Uh, so they're getting these. Now, it's not just... COVID-19 certificates, but it might be other things as well. For example, you might need certain vaccinations before you travel in a certain country. So there might be certain things that you you do to travel through immigration. But basically, lots of things you can buy out there on the internet, but there are systems in place now that are checking these at the back end. So it's Mm. not just the bit of paper you need. Mm. That number needs to actually match up to some country's database Mm. somewhere. So you're only tricking yourselves if you go and do it. But it is a bit scary to see how many... There are 60 Telegram channels that are involved in this one scam alone in the COVID-19 scam. So that's a lot of Telegram channels. You've seen linked cryptocurrency accounts have processed $286,000 worth of transfers. So it's not just a couple of people doing it. There's a lot of people that are doing it. And scammers are directing anti-vaxxers. So they're going onto anti-vax sites and scammers then directing them to these Telegram channels. (laughs) It's just so difficult to navigate your way through all this if you want to try and get around the system. It seems like it's almost better just to... Just to go get yourself the real thing. (laughs) Yeah, that's right. Um, They've got other things as well. They've got drugs. So some of these Telegram channels are selling drugs Mm. like ivermectin. (laughs) So if you want to go and pretend to get some sort of anti-vax. So they're, they're not happy... I've never understood this part. They're not happy to get a vaccination that medical authorities, World Health Organization doctors say is okay, but they're happy to take ivermectin, mm. which doctors say is not okay. So I, I don't quite understand the logic of that yeah. one. So just distrust of society's norms. I know, but and then... I just where are you going with that? Why are you trusting the ivermectin people and not yeah, the... Yeah, that's right. Yep. Anyway, so all of these things that they're selling at the moment... There is no proof whatsoever that anything they sell on any of these channels is legitimate, whether it be ivermectin or a COVID-19 Enter at your own peril, folks. Exactly right. And, and happy Christmas to all those people. <laughs> Parting is such sweet sorrow, particularly when it's an old friend that's seen you through the good times and the bad times. 2024 will mark the year that Australia bid adieu to 3G networks. In the next nine months, the nation will witness a digital switchover impacting millions of devices. Matt, what are the implications for this? Well, first of all, the word adieu, that's one of my favourite word or start-offs. So. Ah, right. Get rid of all those vowels? <laughs> that's right. It's a good one, actually. This, <laughs> one of my kids gave us a, a word or game, a board game, a word or board game for Christmas. And so you're sitting around playing, and I think row eight and adieu were the two most popular words uh-huh. that everyone seemed to start off with. Anyway, <laughs> off the topic slightly there. but So 3G, we've talked about it before on some of the things that will be impacted. But we've actually got one that switched off now in December, on the 15th of December last year. Vodafone switched off their 3G network. Telstra and Optus will follow this year. Telstra is shutting down the 30th of June this year. Optus in September this year. So it was interesting. I wanted to talk a little bit about the Vodafone shutdown because before the 15th of December, there were some fears that, oh no, what was this going to affect? How many people out there were still using Vodafone 3G? Was it going to be a disaster? Was it going to be Y2K proportions? Or was it just going to be a little blip? And well, the, the the stats which you're no doubt going to report, um, if, if you're a businessman, you would be saying, oh, you've got to get rid of 3G. It's just, just cost you us money and it's not giving us any return. Um, but for that small percentage that require it, 
They've got no other alternative well, necessarily. And require it is the interesting point here. So you're right. From a business perspective, from Vodafone, Telstra and Optus, they're supporting a network which has still got infrastructure involved with it. They've still mm. got to make that work. If, you've got it, a, yeah. if, right, if, you've got, if you say you've got 3G, you've got to have 3G. You can't say, well, we've got it until bits of it break down, then we're not going to have it. You've, mm. you've got it, you've got it, you've got to keep supporting it. But to give you an idea, Vodafone said before they switched off that less than 1% of all their mobile data traffic was 3G. Now, that makes sense. Mm. If you're using mobile data, you're going to go for 4G or 5G because it's got higher data speeds. Yeah. They didn't give any data on how many of their phone calls, good old-fashioned phone calls, were still being used on the 3G network. But that was one of the things that I suppose was a concern that some people would suddenly lose access to their phone. Now, Vodafone have talked about the fact that they've been giving 14 months notice or over the last 14 months giving notice to their customers that they're going to shut it down. They've sent supposedly over a million messages to their 3G customers about the shutdown coming. So hopefully you'd think that'd be okay. But what a lot of people don't realize is the other devices, some of the Internet of Things, I suppose you'd, you'd call it, that are running on 3G. In fact, a previous vehicle that I had only had 3G. It was connected to the Internet for a whole range of things and it only had 3G. So Whoever owns that car now, I sold that car, but whoever owns it now, they would have to go and upgrade that to a 4G module to replace that. Now, mm. if the 3G was working for you, you'd go, oh, why bother? It's doing everything I need to do. Not much data is being transmitted, so who really cares? But then suddenly those things stop working. Oh, I've got to do something about it now. About 3 million, which amazed me, 3G dependent devices still in Australia as of December last year. Now, not many of those were in Vodafone because Vodafone customers would have hopefully shut down most of those. About 200,000 of those 3 million are critical medical devices. Ah. So a lot of people with their emergency yeah. button around their neck, for example, a lot of those are 3G because, again, that technology was cheaper. Why would I bother about upgrading that if I don't need to? I don't need lots of data. I just need to send out a signal to say, hey, I'm in trouble. Don't worry about upgrading it. Leave it. Keep going for as long as you can. A lot of people's alarm panels that would trigger back to the central monitoring station would be 3G. And mm. that was a big upgrade from the old days of phone lines because if I was going to break into someone's house, which I'm not planning on doing, but if I was going to, the first thing I'd do is cut their phone cut lines because the yeah. then it can't dial out. So then phone systems, or sorry, alarm companies upgraded to 3G dialers so mm. that it could use the 3G network. Obviously, you need to upgrade those. You're not necessarily even aware that you've got that. You've no, got an alarm right. system. It works. Oh, good. Everything's fine. Yeah, and you've had it for 10, 15 years or so. That's Why right. are you going to check that? It's been doing the job. I, I guess everything's okay with it. So that was a lot of emphasis was put on those various companies to let their customers know. But I was interested to see what happened after Vodafone shut down and whether there was going to be a bunch of stories out there about people who had disasters or medical emergencies or their alarms stopped working. But I heard nothing. Nothing. So it was quite interesting. Silence was deafening. Well, it was, and I think that's a good thing. And obviously, Vodafone did a really good job in terms of letting their customers know. One of the big things, of course, is that apart from, as you mentioned, supporting the infrastructure, shutting down the 3G network makes sense, but also the frequencies that 3G uses, once 3G isn't using those, those frequencies can be then reused for 4G or 5G. Mm. One of the things that's a real challenge is that Telstra, for example, have said that they won't shut the 4G network, sorry, the 3G network down until they're convinced that 4G gives exactly the same or better coverage than the old 3G network. So that's a big promise to make. Mm. And there are people now who still talk to me about travelling on open roads and they'll see their phone flick from 4G down to 3G, can't do much via data, but they can still make phone calls. Mm. You've got to be sure that you're never going to have that situation where I used to be able to make a phone call standing right here and now yeah. I can't anymore. So again, well done to Vodafone. They seem to have navigated that fairly well, but Vodafone are the smallest of the three mobile phone networks in Australia. So Watch this space the big test a... will be Telstra and Optus this year. How many times have you found yourself in a situation with your hands full and a third arm would have been a game changer. Well, have you ever wrapped an awkward Christmas present? I rest my case. A remote-controlled robotic third arm is not a new concept, but being able to control it while your hands are all already occupied is a major dilemma. Well, hold your breath and watch this space, literally, because the clever folks at the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology have got a solution that will blow our collective minds, Matt. I'm sure that the 
initial creator, you, you talked about the Swiss Federal Institute. I'm sure there were some individuals who said, this is, a, this is a great idea. I'm sure they didn't have kids because I assume that's why we had kids. So you've got that third arm to hold the packaging <laughs> down while you're wrapping a Christmas present. You've got to apply just the right amount of pressure and then you've got to tangle with that bit of sticky tape which, which right. wants to fold back on itself. And that's where the kids come in. You go, yeah. put your hand right there and hold it there. Yeah. Now I've got to get the sticky tape over the finger without <laughs> sticking your finger to the present. Which is fine provided you're not wrapping their presents. <laughs> that's, that's right. That's a bit of a problem, isn't it? So I started to think, why would I want a third arm? Apart from wrapping Christmas presents, which is a great example, but what might I do with a third arm? And then is there enough of an application that I might go to all the trouble of inventing a third arm and then how do I control it? So obviously there was enough of a need. We'll come back to that in a moment. But controlling it sounded fascinating. Controlling it with your diaphragm. So you connect the third arm essentially around your stomach. The third arm sticks out as if it's something protruding from your stomach. And then (laughs) with both eye movements and your diaphragm, you control the third arm. Now, I'm assuming you're not getting very fine motor control out of it just by controlling it with your diaphragm. Mm. But one of the things they found absolutely fascinating was that the human brain, and we often talk about the human brain being very elastic. In this scenario, they found the human brain very adaptable to controlling a third arm. Because that was one of the things I thought of was, wow. well, I sometimes have trouble rubbing my head and patting my stomach. <laughs> How am I going to control a third arm in that scenario? But the human brain's quite clever. So it actually, in the testing they did, they had 65 volunteers testing this, and they actually got the volunteers to use it, and they found that they could use it quite well without a lot of time because the brain adapted and wow. said, I've now got this third arm there. Neuroplasticity. What an amazing thing. Thank you. That's the word I was looking for. I used the word elastic. That was incorrect. I think plasticity was the word I was looking for. So... Industrial workers, surgeons, oh, how would I feel about going into surgery and my last yeah. vision before I went up to sleep <laughs> was going, a third arm? Working this thing around his waist and, and waving I, to me. I, I wake it. up and go, those <laughs> drugs you gave me were crazy. I had this dream that a surgeon with three arms was operating on me. <laughs> but surgeons apparently uh, are using this in some of the tests they're doing. But industrial workers, and I can see that one where, for example, there was one particular person who said that he was doing some soldering and found that being able to use a third arm to hold some part of the solder while Mm. he was manipulating the circuit board and his soldering iron around, that seemed to make sense. I went, okay, Mm. I can live with that. So anything that's got some complex operations or multitasking sounds like an application. I did wonder whether the primary driver was someone who had lost an arm, for example, someone who had a a disability and needed some other arm. But it didn't Mm. seem to be that. It seemed Mm. to be more around adding functionality to people with two arms rather than restoring functionality to people with only one arm or or maybe no arms at all. There's the famous film clip out of the movie where the person's got six fingers playing the piano and they wrote a piano piece for six fingers. So I do wonder whether we'll start to see piano pieces, instruments maybe for people with three arms. (laughs) Who knows? So (laughs) it does sound fascinating. And we are getting better all the time with our robotics and being able to control those robotics and adding to our human functionality. So, so you're controlling it with your diaphragm. It's just controlling your breathing. So it's how you breathe. Well, I wondered about that, and I thought, can I control my diaphragm without breathing? Can I, do I have to stop breathing to use this? But I think you can actually control movements of your diaphragm without changing your breathing as such. And yeah, right. again, it didn't seem to take a lot of training for people to be able to actually use it and actually manipulate it. So, And if you sneeze, <laughs> someone's going to get slapped in the head. I did worry about that as well. <laughs> you, you do something, you have a cough or a sneeze, yeah. you're in all sorts of trouble. Hiccups? Oh, no. <laughs> uh, keep an eye for this one. It sounds fascinating. New cars are loaded with tech to do the thinking for you and prevent collisions these days. Whether you're hurtling down the highway or reversing in and out of a tight park, we're just used to the bleeps now and they come part and parcel with the modern driving experience. But is our trust in technology making us worse drivers in the long run? Matt, what are your thoughts? I remember when seatbelts and airbags were, well seatbelts have been around for a long time, but airbags were just coming out on American cars. And they found that people were not wearing their seatbelts because they said, I don't need it. I've got an airbag. (laughs) Everything's fine. And no amount of explanation by some of the experts to say, well, actually, it works better with both of them together. Mm -hmm. Restraining your seat helps, and then having the airbag helps as well. But there were people who were quite happy to not worry about a seatbelt anymore because I've got an airbag. So I think sometimes we do get a little bit too much faith in the technology, but Mm. it's there So I think the more we use it, the better. Now, I've got some examples here where we've seen things that could be solved by technology, either in 
the conditions that we drive in, so making people aware of those conditions or what might be on the car. So, for example, there was a massive 30-vehicle collision on Victoria's Western Highway, and that was basically due to fault. Mm. And so if you had, for example, conditions that were speed-dependent or speed-dependent conditions, so you had warning signs up, 100 k's an hour, but mm. fog comes in and they're having automatic sensors to say the speed limit now is 60 k's an hour or mm. depending on the fog, whatever that might be. That's one thing that a lot of experts are talking about, having the speeds applied to various roads dependent upon weather conditions. And as we know, as the climate changes, we're going to see more and more of those. So there were a few examples of fog in Louisiana and the US, a super fog led to a 150 car crash with eight fatalities wow. over in Kent in the UK, 120 vehicles were involved, wow. involved in a fog related accident. So we do see those sort of things happen on a semi-regular basis. Now, of course, we've got one part of it in terms of changing the speed that you're allowed to drive at having some sort of sensors there, but then the cars themselves are getting better and a lot of the radar controls can see through that fog, so they're not relying on vision, they're relying on radar, which can obviously see through that fog and give you some warnings about that. So getting cars to be better with those processes, I think, makes a lot of sense. One of the things I found fascinating was that November next year, November 2025, all Australian cars must have reversing cameras and motion sensors as standard. Ah, Now, that's not going to help us with accidents on the highway, but it's certainly going to stop little dings, little... Yeah, little dings that you get uh, every now and then. That's right. And so I don't see those as essential to our safety, but it's certainly inconvenient when you have something where you just back into someone, oh, no, it's the insurance processes, it's how long it takes to get fixed up, it's all Mm. those things, your car off the road while it's getting fixed up. So all those things are very frustrating. One thing annoys me is the beep that you get when it senses that you're drifting out of the lane. And I get it, you know, it saves people who are falling asleep. Wakes them up, yep. stuff. But sometimes that sensor, I think, is just a little bit too sensitive. Yeah, you'd have to vary <laughs> too close to, or you'd, you'd have to go very close to those sidelines and something that's no. beeping away at you. Yeah. And the other one that gets me is that as you're cornering, no cars ahead, good clear road, you tend to just cut the corner a little bit. And, of mm. course, that cuts the white mm. line a little bit and then starts beeping at you halfway around the corner, starts trying to push you back into the middle of the road. But so it's interesting. So we've got various things that are happening that are going to make things compulsory. The average age of a car in Australia is 11.3 years of age. So a lot of them don't have some of these latest safety features on them. Any change that we make obviously is not going to be retrospective. It would be too expensive to try and fit some of these safety features. But I just think we've got to get better at getting this new technology when it's available onto as many cars as possible. So autonomous emergency braking, for example, it's a key safety feature. And in the US, a study found that 49% of accidents, front to rear crashes, would have been prevented if they had AEB. Yeah. So, again, I, I've, not that I've been not paying attention, but I've had it take effect when I've been driving along, and yes, I can same. see a car in front, and it's turning off, so I'm comfortable that I'm not going to run into them, but the car says, oh, no, you're getting too close to that, yeah. automatically <laughs> you feel it kick in. That's right. So, yeah. and again, yeah. if you lost attention on the road and you're looking out somewhere else or you, you fell asleep, whatever it might be, having that sort of thing, you can see why it would be a huge Absolutely reduction. Absolutely a lifesaver. When we get to the stage of relying on it too much, though, I think mm. that's where you start to go, well, I can check my phone and start sending text messages off because I've got this car to drive for me. That's when it becomes a bit dangerous. It's getting mm. that fine line where people still are aware of it. But I think we've got to take advantage of this technology. Our road toll is not going down at the rate we would like it to go down. And in fact, in the last year across some parts of Australia, it's actually gone up in the mm. last year, which is a bit yeah. concerning. So we've got to work out ways to get around that and solve this problem. In 2023, artificial intelligence con- conquered new frontiers, with ChatGPT leading the charge. From shaping conversations to infiltrating every digital realm, AI has become an omnipresent force. It's here to stay, and its impact, for better or worse, will be extraordinary. <clears throat> Pardon me. Matt, talk us through the multifaceted marvels and potential pitfalls that this gift horse carries within it. I actually think this was the development of 2023. If I look back at 2023 Absolutely, yeah. and say what changed dramatically. I think we'll look back at it in decades to come and we will look back at this as being the revolution that really changed things. Yeah, look, I think it has. I think it's developed into a sophisticated creative force. It was the number or became the fastest growing app ever was ChatGPT. Mm. So as people started to get the hang of that, a year ago we were maybe mentioning it a couple of 
references to AI and ChatGPT, but suddenly it really started to take over. Google and Microsoft have thrown a huge amount of money at basically AI and, and things like OpenAI, ChatGPT, with Microsoft investing $10 billion in that. Uh, Microsoft integrated GPT-4 into Bing, Word, and Excel. And then, of course, Google launched BARD in February, which didn't go so well. Mm. And then they launched Gemini, which was supposedly a, a rival to GPT-4 in December. Uh, governments glo- globally are talking about AI as a threat and an opportunity. Is there some way we can help solve major problems in the world with AI? Yes, does it present huge risks? Yes. So there's a whole range of things to consider. Mm. The EU is planning to regulate large AI models by 2025. So they're looking to say, well, sure, you've got these things there, but no one is policing this. No one's saying, are you using it for good or bad? Are you using it in the right way or the wrong way? When you look at the value of the AI market in 2023, it was $93 billion. Wow. What an incredible year. For the first year that something became really mainstream, $93 billion for that. It's uh, quite incredible. So I don't know where we're going to go with it. It's become mainstream tools already. People are just rolling it out. I'm seeing TV shows, movies, all sorts of things, mm. referencing chat GPT, referencing AI already. So it's become mainstream but very it's quickly. it's also got us questioning – what's real and what's not yep. uh, <laughs> really throwing it a spanner in the works like um that I, those I, ai film trailers with uh people uh, and scenes in it that you know you sure you've never seen before but oh it's in there and you know. yeah and of course they're not they're, they're not there. why wreck we, the we movie we did a story about that last year yeah, yeah. that's right why wreck the movie when <laughs> and, and sometimes you do that you look at a movie and you oh, I've seen this bit because I saw the trailer but having a trailer that's not from the movie yeah. fantastic so all these things it really comes down to that human creativity and then take advantage of the power of AI mm. what are we going to do with it next it is a fascinating area but that to me if I had to put my finger on something that was the technology change of 2023 AI, and in particular ChatGPT, there's no doubt about it that that was the one. And even the firing of Sam Altman and then the outrage from the company Mm. and then basically the reinstatement of Sam shows just how important he was in this whole process. Yes. Have you got yourself a Roomba yet? Robotic vacuums are nice, but pretty much limited to a single purpose, wouldn't you say? It's a 20-year-old tech, and that's what it is after all. As we head down towards the next quarter of this century, it's time for an upgrade, perhaps even a robot that can be taught household chores, Matt. Why not? It does seem a bit limiting, doesn't it? A Roomba vacuums that area there. That's it. That's all it can do. (laughs) We've talked about some other robots that have got fairly specific functions. And I know when you look at car manufacturing plants, they've got robots in there, but that robot, your job is to pick up that bonnet and move it to there yeah. and keep it there ready for Grab fastening. this rivet, pop it in there. That's it. So fairly limited. But you've got a new robot called Dob E. I assume they've somehow fashioned that on wall E. It's uh, D-O-B-B yeah. hyphen capital E. And basically it can be taught to do certain things and fairly quickly. So for example, you spend about five minutes training it on a task and then give it another 15 minutes for it to go through and process that and you've got a robot that can do something else. So they tried it in 20 different New York apartments to give it a real-world feel. They got it to perform 109 different tasks. Oh, wow. At the end of that, they found that 81% was their accuracy rate. So it wasn't too bad, not perfect. And so what did they train it on? They did things like open a cupboard. So they could say to Dobby, go and open a cupboard for me. Okay, train it. And away I did it. Mm. Go and pull out a chair. I want to sit down, so pull out a chair for me. I assume you can then push in the chair. Remove a towel from a towel rail to then take it to the wash. So train it up on certain individual tasks. And then once you've done that, then presumably you can combine all those into a series of tasks and then basically let it do lots of things for you. They found some challenges reflective surfaces for a challenge. Ah. I'm not sure why, but reflective surfaces, they had a bit of a, this particular robot had some troubles with that. And heavy objects at height, and I get that because it's pretty easy to topple something over. Oh, yeah. Like a forklift fully extended, it's a bit easier to topple something over when it's fully extended. So apart from that, they found that, yeah, pretty much any general task around the house, things like getting something in the fridge or opening cupboards, it could do with a limited amount of training. And I can just see people going out, when this robot comes 
commercially available <laughs> and saying, great, but I don't want to do all that training. I remember when you had to go and train a computer to learn your voice and people just didn't get the full value out of dictation software because they yeah. never wanted to spend the time training it. So I reckon when people start buying this, the training aspect of it will just be too hard and they couldn't be bothered doing it and then away they'll go, they'll, they'll sit in the corner. Well, with new technology breeds, new uh, opportunities for um, employment as well. Maybe you could be the trainer. Yeah, Maybe well, you could true. be a professional robot trainer. <laughs> I'll come around to your place. I'll train your robot on what you want it to do <laughs> and away you go. Or you can just hire me to do the things you want to do anyway. Yeah. But no, it sounds much more interesting with a robot. So keep an eye on that one, Dob E. Alternative energy tech has become somewhat of a boom industry in sciences and developing new batteries that are more efficient and more sustainable have been a huge part of this. Hydrogen fuel cell technology seems to be the zone that is exciting for many people. Well, it's been given a tweak now. And to put it right out in front in terms of affordability and efficiency as a form of green energy. It's time to raid the cutlery drawer, folks, because the price of silver is possibly about to surge. Am I right, Matt? Well, hopefully not. Hopefully that's part of the whole concept here because one of the problems with hydrogen fuel cells in the past has been they use platinum. Platinum, yeah. And platinum is expensive. And these researchers, and it's been a collaborative effort, it's been the Department of Energy's SLAC, National Accelerator Laboratory, it's been Stanford University and the Toyota Research Institute. And they've been working together to try and work out ways they can generate or produce hydrogen fuel cells better. And one of the ways they've done that is they said, let's replace the platinum with silver. Now, hopefully there's enough silver in the world that it won't send the price to the roof because that would defeat the purpose and then mm. go back to the stage of platinum being a viable alternative because it's then cheaper than silver, but hopefully that doesn't happen. And again, what we've got here is fuel cells. The concept of fuel cells is basically you've got an electric vehicle. It runs like an electric vehicle, but rather than having a large battery, you've got hydrogen which is faster to refuel and then mm. easier to store on the vehicle. Well, when I say easier to store, you've got to store it in some sort of container, which might be a bit difficult, but you can refuel it quickly. So then it drives like an electric vehicle, runs like an electric vehicle, mm. but you've got that hydrogen stored there. I know Toyota have talked a lot about this being the technology of the future. I think they've been saying that because they've missed the boat on EVs to a certain extent. Mm. And I still think EVs will be the way to go in passenger vehicles, light vehicles, but when you get to heavy vehicles, when you get to large transport vehicles, having that car parked off the side of the road charging up is not generating money. Mm. On the road, travelling is when you generate money. So I think hydrogen fuel cells will be incredibly important for things like those long-haul transport trucks. I think that'll be a big part of that. I'm sure there'll be vehicles, I've driven a vehicle that's a hydrogen fuel cell vehicle, so they are available, but I don't know they'll be mainstream as much as EVs. But if you can get silver being used instead of platinum, that suddenly changes the cost or the economics mm. of a hydrogen fuel cell vehicle. One of the big costs for an electric vehicle, of course, is the battery. But if you can get a hydrogen fuel cell produced at a much cheaper rate, suddenly that becomes a mo lot more attractive. Is this going to be a game changer? Well, not yet, but it's probably going to start to shift the needle across to hydrogen as a good way of having vehicles powered rather than just electric vehicles with batteries. So interesting uh, again, with hydrogen, they generate electricity through this chemical reaction between hydrogen and oxygen. Water is the only byproduct of that. How you create the hydrogen in the first place is the challenge as That's well. That's the challenge, yeah. We've got lots of water, so great, but you've got to get the hydrogen out of the water to actually have hydrogen that you can use and that's a fairly energy intensive process you really want to use renewables for that process i just think the uh, battery technology has got a long way to go it's come a long way but it's got a long way to go and it's going to be really very exciting to yeah. see what happens in this field well what i do love is you've got competition you've got competition mm. between hydrogen fuel cells and electric vehicles and different electric vehicle manufacturers and different electric battery technology so all this competition means that mm. you and i as a consumer are going to benefit in the long run mm. Apple has run into a spot of legal bother over their Apple Watch Series 9 and their Ultra 2 models, and they've been ordered to cease distribution over a serious patent clash with Massimo. Matt, Apple like to run the game as if they write the rules. Are they going to be forced to eat humble pie yet again? I'm fascinated by this. I just can't believe Apple's legal team has been temporarily beaten on this one. Normally, they just come in with their sledgehammer yeah, and they don't go. care whether it's a mosquito. <laughs> <laughs> They're going to just hit that with a sledgehammer. So this is related to blood oxygen sensing technology. And so, as you said there, Massimo, the company said, 
we actually have that patent. We've got products that use that, and you kind of used our patent on your products. So a judge agrees, and they said stop sales. Now, obviously, Apple, being Apple, said we don't agree with that, and we'll <laughs> lodge uh, about 28,000 uh, lawyers or launch 28,000 lawyers at this particular yeah. problem rather than just say to Massimo, how about we pay you some money? Maybe Massimo are trying to have a lender them, but the fact they've been able to get sales stopped is quite significant. Now, when you consider that, and sales stopped in December, so December 21, online sales stopped, in source sales stopped on December 24, this is in the US, that wouldn't be nice for Apple. Now, Apple mm. Watches aren't their number one generator of revenue, but if Apple only sold watches, they'd still be a Fortune 150 company. <laughs> <laughs> so it gives you an idea of it's still of some value to them. Yeah. So there's a, a bit of a process going on in terms of that legal dispute. They're throwing lawyers at it. They'll have that argument. Interestingly enough, internationally, those watches can still be sold. So the patent dispute is in the US only at this stage. Now, if they end up being successful there, Apple might have to pay them some money and it might have to basically go across the world. Who knows there? But I found it fascinating that here in Australia, you can still buy those watches, but in the US, you can't. So that's an interesting part. The other part is the Apple Watch SE doesn't have the same technology in there. So they can still sell Apple Watch SE and Apple Watch Series 8, Apple Ultra Series 1. They can still be sold. So it's mm. really only the latest 9 and Series 2 of the Ultra. And is it because they've got to. that uh, blood oxygen um, sensor? Tenting technology, that's exactly right. Yeah. And we often talk about the incredible number of things that watches can do now. We thought it was great when it could just do heart rates now yeah. with blood oxygen sensing, ECG, a whole range of things that watches can now do, quite incredible, but obviously they're using someone's technology to be able to do that. In this case, the judges waved the finger at Apple and said, you can't keep doing that. Oh. Where this develops, who knows? <laughs> this isn't the way Apple wanted to end 2023, I'm sure. <laughs> and on that note, well, before we head off to our, our, our finishing off, um, our closing for this episode, it might be worth just talking about um, what your predictions are going to be for... 2024, and what are going to be the big stories? It's impossible, thank you, James, for me to make predictions with technology because I've done it before. I used to do a regular column that had the 10 big predictions, and I'd look at it at the end of the year and I'd go, how wrong was I? It's just impossible. <laughs> but it's fun to make those predictions it's fun and anyway. then what look the back and go, it's right. what were you thinking? So despite my failures in the past, I actually want to talk a little bit this year about quantum computing. I think oh, yeah. in terms of what's happening, quantum computing is going to be the big thing this year because we've got some companies getting close. Now, I'll talk a little bit about quantum computing, and I will say this with a slight disclaimer, that I don't fully understand how you can practically create a quantum computer. Mm. I'll talk about the theory of it a little bit to start with. Let's go back to computers and just talk about how computers work. Now, if we go back as far as 1822, there was the Babbage Difference Engine, and I kind of think about that as the first computer. It wasn't oh. what we think of today as a computer. I would have, I would have gone fast forwarded up to the fifties. Was it the fifties where they had ENIAC? You yeah, to talk about ENIAC. Correct. Yeah. yeah. So 1822, that Babbage Difference Engine could be thought of as a computer. But you're right. If you go to the fifties, if 1950s, we're talking here. We've got Colossus and ENIAC. So ENIAC was electronic numeral. Numerical, sorry, integrator. Sorry, I'll do all that again. <laughs> Electronic numerical integrator that. and computer. <laughs> so it actually there were computer in there in ENIAC, and that worked on about eighteen thousand vacuum tubes, mm. two hundred kilowatts of power it needed, and it weighed about thirty tons. Now the the whole concept with computers is that they work on binary. They work on a switch being on, on or, or off. off. Yeah. And so based on that, and that's why you need so many vacuum tubes, based on on or off, you can then have... We used to call them valves, didn't we? Valves, yep, yeah. that's right. You can have lots of things happen. So if we look at binary, and if I just go, for example, to the ASCII, the American Standard Code for Information Interchange System, 0 to 255 in our decimal system is represented with 8 bits of binary data, and that gives you a byte, and that gives you all those different characters. For example, the digit 9 is 00111001, or the number 65 0100001. Do you know there are 10 types of people who, um, in this world, 10 types of people, those who understand binary and those who don't. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> <laughs> so effectively, you've got computers working on that system, on or off. What we did in 1947 was we, I use the proverbial we there, society basically created the transistor. 
and all the transistor did was replace all those vacuum tubes or valves and put it on a chip. So now when you go to a modern computer, you have literally got billions of transistors mm. on a chip to have lots of those on, off, yes, no, those binary points of decision. Doing all of that and building up huge amounts of power involves basically all those switches being done sequentially. Mm. And essentially, you get the fancy computers, if you like, that we see today with all of that information there. But what a quantum computer does, and probably the easiest way I can explain it, is I think of a coin toss. I was at the cricket earlier this month, and I watched Pat Cummins go out, flip the coin, and wait for Shard Massoon to call heads or tails. We understand that. That's binary. Heads or tails, assuming that the mm. coin doesn't land in a crack on its edge, <laughs> it's going to be a head or a tail. They're the only points. So the same with a computer. It's a zero or it's a one. It's a yes or it's a no. It's an on or it's an off. Quantum says when I flip the coin in the air, it's all those things at once. It's all between heads and tails mm. at once. So all those different states you can have, and by using all those different states, it can essentially process information simultaneously, not sequentially. That's the kind of basic concept where yeah. it's at every single state at the same time. Now, how you apply that practically, that's where I get a bit lost. How you say, <laughs> I'm going to take a practical computer, I understand zeros and ones, I understand switches on and off, but how I build a quantum computer, and typically they're built at very low temperatures, you need superconductors to build them, but how I make a computer understand being at all states at the same time and then use that to calculate things, that's where I go, no, nah, I need more information. I, I just don't have enough information. But what's already happened is that Microsoft, IBM, Google have all said they're close to having practical quantum computing. Google claims to have a 53 qubit quantum computer that can perform one task they created that would take the world's fastest supercomputer at the moment 10,000 years to complete, and it can do it in 200 seconds. What? And this is <laughs> so, the problem we have with supercomputer, with sorry, with quantum computing. So we're probably not going to be using these as PCs or laptops, are we? I think, oh, we, you will. think we will. At some stage in decades to come. Teleportation, here we come. Well, that's the thing. What do you do with a quantum computer? Well, the first thing I thought of was climate modeling. There's mm. so many variables in climate modeling, what's going to happen in the future. Mm then we just don't have a supercomputer fast enough to do all that at the level that quantum computing could. Drug development, when we start to talk about developing drugs and trying so many different interactions of drugs and molecules, that takes a computer a lot of work to then come up with something that you should test. Quantum computers can do that much faster. Cancer treatments much faster. Financial management, seeing what's going to happen. Financial mm. markets, fantastic. Cyber security, absolutely brilliant. But then... The first thing I thought of when I thought of cybersecurity was the flip side of that. Encryption mm. models that we've got now, when we've got banking that it relies on encryption and we all rely on that, we use a banking app, that's all right because it's all encrypted, a quantum computer could break that encryption <sighs> standing on its head, <laughs> hands tied behind its back before breakfast and, and laugh at the encryption method you've got in place. So with all this power comes so the ability. So going to go back to cash dashed under the mattress? <laughs> that's that's exactly what my I wife think. said. When I said this to her, I said, oh, Connor, you know, talking to them. So should we stuck, stick some cash under the mattress? And I went, well, I don't think we're there yet, but that's the potential of what we've got. What we've got to do is get the good guys using quantum computers to develop cybersecurity before the bad guys start using quantum computers to break oh. the encryption methods. <laughs> so it's a scary thing, but keep an eye. We'll talk about it throughout the year. Keep an eye on that. I think quantum computing is where we're going to see huge Here changes this year. Brave new world. Mm. And with that, ladies and gentlemen, we ask you to stow your tray tables and return your seat to the upright position because we're bringing this plane into land. Thanks for another smooth flight, Captain Matt. Well, hopefully I didn't scare too many people at the end there. <laughs> I'm a little bit excited about those ro robotic arms, though, uh, and the potential for hijinks. My mind is ticking at 100 miles per hour here. Good, clean, fun, folks. And if anyone is trying to think of what to get me for Christmas, you have about 11 and a half months to get organised. Thanks for tuning in once again, folks, whether you're local to us here in sunny New South Wales or somewhere on a distant shore. We're always grateful for your company and thank you for taking 45 minutes out of your week to spend with us. I'm your host, James Eddy, and Matt and I are looking forward to catching you again in another week's time for another bright and shiny new episode of Tech Talk. Hope you're having a productive start to 2024. We'll see you next time.